Well, let me first of all say thank you for inviting me. And I do feel honored to be in, in particularly in this part of, of Google's operations. I use your products probably once a minute. Uh, it, the, w w when me and Peter were working together, our, our success metrics were things like um, something called Barb, which is a sort of theoretical thing that tells you how many people have watched you on TV. My success metrics are now how many people watch my YouTube videos, and that's only in a space of 10 years. Uh, so, yeah, thank you. And I'll just consult my iPhone uh, for the next bit of um, what I'm about to say. Um, so, look. In my book, there's a big critique of what we call neoliberalism, free market economics, the current model of capitalism. And I'm going to cut to the chase and skip that over because I think what I wanted to say to you and is, a, a is it have a conversation with you about the more core idea of the book, which is the other bit of it, which is the idea that we may be entering a transition beyond what we know as capitalism. Uh, and that this transition is primarily driven by technology. And I want to kind of sort of explain what I mean by that and get your feedback on it and maybe have a discussion with Peter and with yourselves about it. So there's been lots of people before me uh, posing the question, can capitalism survive? Will it one day run out? Will it ru are there limits to it? Uh, Adam Smith, uh, John Stuart Mill, Karl Marx, David Ricardo, the great economists of the 19th century all were obsessed with the problem that capitalism might M Malthus as well, uh, the population specialist, uh, ob obsessed with the idea that capitalism might one day reach its limits. But the reason we, don't, we haven't for 150 years tended to worry about that is because whenever it has reached limits, whenever specific societal business models have reached a limit or an impasse, what has generally happened is that capitalism has adapted and therefore, you know, it, when I first, when I went to university, the theory of complex systems didn't exist, okay? In, an, in, the, in the late 1970s, it was in its infancy. But now, I think we have a, a really n niche label to be able to talk about capitalism as a 250-year-old industrial system. Uh, and it is as a complex, adaptive system, which hopefully, as engineers, some of you have knowledge of that concept, that systems can be complex and adapt now, in other words, I'm not saying, hey, capitalism's doomed simply because it has contradictions. I'm saying that capitalism might be about to transition to something else because it has lost its ability to adapt. And why might it have lost its ability to adapt? The answer is to do with the specific nature of information technology. Now, before we go into that, Let's just examine the ways in which capitalism has adapted. OK, I'm, I'm told you're mainly engineers, so that may, may mean some of you have not a massive grounding in social and economic history. But the sort of 101 version is this. About every 50 years, the societal business model hits, hits, a, hits a, a buffer, hits a problem. And what we tend to observe is a fairly rapid mutation of the system, new social institutions, new mixture of industry, finance, services, um, consumption. Uh, the classic one is in the 1840s where the railways arrive to take over from an initial spurt of development that was, that was fueled by the rise of the factory system alongside canals, you get railways. And then in the 1890s, you get what we call the second industrial revolution, this fusion of electrical engineering, of material science, of, uh, of big infrastructure. Uh, iron, replaced, iron is replaced by steel. The telegraph is replaced by telephones, etc., etc. And then in World War II, we get this other adaptation, this huge synthesis, a new, a new synthesis between technology, consumption, etc. One of the things we observe when we look as social historians at these moments of mutation and big change in capitalism is that there's nearly always, when something goes wrong, the knee-jerk reaction is nearly always for the elite to try and solve it through pressure on wages, pressure on consumption. Basically, you just cut everybody's wages and carry on as normal. And usually, up to now, what's happened is that that hasn't worked uh, because workers resisted. Um, the 1880s and 90s are a brilliant example of this from social history. Um, 
But this time it didn't happen because the specific solution that was adopted when the old Keynesian economics of the 1970s and 80s fell apart was what, uh, what we call neoliberalism, that is a free market system in which wages were more or less strategically suppressed. Some of you, any Americans here may know that the median <coughs> hourly male, male wage in America was the same in 2008 as it was in 1973. So uh, lower was much worse, higher was much better. Um, and this is a problem because it means that, w uh, and this is the, 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 the kind of uh, clue number one why we, why, we're, why we might be facing strategic, big, 200 year long kind of e epochal change, is that if you, go, if you get a s situation where capitalism is in trouble and it adapts through suppressing wages, then what it eventually does is it, it finds another solution to consumption and that is credit. So since about the 1990s, we, we, we had a situation where wages are suppressed for, for the mass of people, and yet credit is very, very much more available than it ever was. What happens there is it's almost like a law of physics, some of you physicians <coughs> in the room, the law of physics, but it's economic, that if you've got, if you've got static incomes and ever-expanding credit, then at some point the kind of wine collections and the art collections and the luxury apartments at Boxall Bridge cannot go on rising in value and they just snap back. We call that a boom-bust cycle. And we've lived through three in 15 years. So this is a signal that something might be wrong with the economics that is not being actually solved by the technology. It's not being solved by the creation of new, high-value, high-wage, high, um, high sort of well-being synthesis of the kind you got in the 10 to 15 years before, before World War I. Okay, now, here's my explanation, drawn on the work of others, of why that might be happening. Because information technology is different in the three, three following ways. First of all, it, it is corroding the price mechanism. Now, an economist called Paul Romer in 1990 uh, wrote a paper that uh, has gone down in history for its title because a British politician, Ed Balls, once tried to quote it in Parliament. It's called Endogenous Technological Change. But the, the, the 101 version of it is that, that if you can... If the reproduction cost of something is, is dictated by the actions command C, command V, uh, then, then economics tells you that its price should fall to zero or close to zero because you're using zero energy or almost no energy, almost no labour and almost no materials. We'll come to how much material, energy and labour you're using in a minute. But if you can copy something for free, then economics, mainstream, non-Marxist economics tells you that its, its price is going to be close to zero under conditions of competition. This is what Roma says. Also about I information goods is they are what economists call non-rival. So if you smoke one inch of a cigarette, I can't smoke that one inch. I can smoke the next inch, especially if it's one of those cigarettes that you share, uh, <laughs> but, but, but I can't smoke the same inch as you. It's a rival good, not true of an MP3 track not true of the, um, of the database that builds a Boeing 787. Uh, you can copy it and use it at the exact same time for free. Now, Roma said, in this situation, the only thing that keeps the price mechanism, i.e. things cost more than zero, is if you, if you artificially create scarcity, because information is now abundant. It's unlike all other goods. Obviously, there are limits to it. The limits are storage and bandwidth, but information is essentially abundant as far as most people are concerned. And so what you do to maintain any kind of price is you, is you create artificial restrictions on it using either a widget. That, you remember DVDs? You couldn't copy a DVD because there was a widget inside the protected software that takes, you know, kind of 13-year-olds about 10 seconds to break, but nevertheless, it's there. Or you get a good lawyer and you arrest every person in the car park of the supermarket going around with fake DVDs and you sue the pants off everybody who tries to copy. You shut down BitTorrent, etc., etc., etc. No, you can do that. But essentially, the good itself is replicable for free. Um, the next thing information does, and you will be very, very aware of this, some of the audiences I speak to are just, oh, wow, is it? Information 
delinks work from wages. E information blurs the distinction between work and non-work, or what we used to call life, uh, and and it it it. it it delinks work from wa work hours from wages. So my dad's generation, they turn up at a factory. If you're not there on the production line cranking the screw here, I can't tweak the nut here. So you and me have to turn up at the same time and the work is sequential, it goes past. Best to give us both a little card, clock into a machine that goes clunk um, and pay us when we arrive and stop paying us when we leave. That's work, that, that's capitalist work. Your work is different. I mean. When I tell people about the whiteboard and the yellow post-it notes who are not in the world you're in, they, don't, they go, wow, really, do people work like that? But you know, you'll know that the, the modular basis of most information work, you pick up the bit of the project, you work with it for a bit, you put the post-it note back, you record your work, somebody else can take, pick it up. Modular work allows very, very easily distributed and networked forms of organisation. But it really challenges what are we being paid for? So my common experience, like some of you, is you get on a plane to Brussels, you try and keep your elbows away from the person next to you, you try and do a bit of work. Um, if it was a factory, it would be closed down on health and safety grounds, uh, the, the, the kind of morning flight to Brussels. But we are actually all working. Nobody asked us, what time did you start work? Nobody really cares if I flip to the latest episode of Game of Thrones when I get sick of my spreadsheet. Because we're working to target, not to time. And that in itself is quite interesting because it, it means at the higher level we're all target based rather than time based and at the lower level we tend to create jobs in a lot of societies that, are, that almost don't need to exist. We could be automating a lot of work a lot faster but the societal limits to it, our fear of creating um, the, the Oxford Martin Institute says 47% of all jobs are automatable within 30 years. Our fear of doing it means we don't do it and we instead create lots of person-to-person -person jobs that are very, very low value um, that probably don't need to exist. When I, the first time I walked into a McDonald's where you could touch screen and, um, and, and do your order on a touch screen and then swipe your card, I, I, I mentally cheered because because uh, it's no fun being one of those people behind the counter. It's no fun standing in the queues going, am I being served or not being served? Is she serving me or not? Uh, and the whole thing is automatable. And uh, who knew? Uh, um, when I first got a car, uh, we used to put it into something called a car wash. Yeah? Um, it was a machine. You know, you put, you put your, your coin in and the thing came over you and washed your car. Who knew that eight guys with rags could undercut that machine? They undercut it because labour is so cheap. And, they, and in other words, we're not forced to innovate. Um, so that's the second thing, work and wages. And the third thing that flows on from the modularity is that organisations and hierarchies and ownerships are beginning to fragment as well. So you know that, that many people in your space, also in the open source space, will literally be working in non-managed uh, non-managed hierarchies. They'll be working in very flat hierarchies. They'll be working sometimes non-managed. And in some organisations, the product is produced in a non-managed way. Wikipedia is a great example uh, because nobody tells some professor sitting in Seattle or wherever to, to do a page about Napoleon. They just do it. The, the, the organisation facilitates the, cre the voluntary creation of a product um, but, it's, but you could see those of you who use open source tools will know that, in fact, that way of working, it's not like somebody sitting at the, in the middle of a committee. Uh, there is a committee on TCP IP, isn't there? There's a committee that looks after it. But that committee doesn't tell people how to improve it. It just improves itself through interaction of people who use it and make improvements to it, Ruby on Rails, etc. So... These three things, the price mechanism dissolving, the link between work and wages dissolving, and then organisations and hierarchies, uh, organisations and hierarchies being decentralised, falling apart, and the ownership of things not, not being clear. So who owns um, Wikipedia? Well, you know, kind of technically probably Jimmy Wales probably owns it, but it is an open source product with which every other corporation on earth, if you trace their IP addresses, uh, transacts every day, probably every minute. Um, this is very new in the history of capitalism. So, the price for thing is the most important thing. Why? Because it doesn't just impact on um, it doesn't just impact on information goods, on virtual things. In fact, 
I kind of rebel against the word cyber, immaterial and virtual because um, as, the, as the Oxford professor of philosophy, Luciano Faridi, tells us, um, information is physical. Those of you who've studied cybernetics know about Norbert Wiener, the, the founder of cybernetics in 1948, writes, um, information is neither mass nor energy. It is, it is something new and materialism has to adjust to, to adapt for that. I disagree with that and Floridi does as well. I say information has its own dynamic separate to mass and energy. Of course, funnily enough, it has, it, it, the laws of, uh, of that dynamic are weirdly uh, mappable onto the, onto the you know, laws of thermodynamics. But leave that aside. But it, ha it needs mass and energy for representation and therefore it exists in the physical world. And that's what explains any physical good that is heavily dependent on an information content is also very susceptible to this exponential price fall that is inherent in the idea of information costs nothing to reproduce. And so you will know that if I add PowerPoint, that the price of bandwidth, processing power and storage is all over a 15 year period exponentially off a cliff like that. Uh, Deloitte, the consultancy, believes, I don't know whether this is true, believes that that exponentiality will just carry on. They call them exponential technologies. And it means that we've never lived through. My dad's generation, my granddad's generation, industrial workers in factories never lived through a period when, when a technology fell off a cliff in price terms. And how do we know that it's important? Because it's also affecting things like DNA sequencing. The, the exponential curve of DNA sequencing price fall is faster than Moore's law. It's actually bang off a cliff. If you thought your kids would make a big living, a high value living, sequencing DNA, no they won't. Um, what do we call it? Synthesizing DNA, yes, because that's a lot harder. But eventually, information will, technology will develop to a point where we can do that exponentially faster and cheaper as well. So. What happens? What's capitalism doing? How is it changing to, to defend itself against these problems? Well, you're sitting in one of the defense mechanisms. The evolution of the large technology company, wh which exists one way or another, or put it simply like this, to, to, to create a barrier around some information products whereby their price does not fall to zero. Now, your one is quite an interesting one. We could talk about the interesting way it, it, it is it adapted. I, I'm a fan of it. Um, but let me give you a good example. 99p a track on iTunes. Do, what, what determines that price? Supply? No, the supply is infinite. Demand? No, the demand might be infinite, actually. Uh, we, don't know, we don't care what the demand is. Quality? No. The same track by some bog standard group is the same as a, a, a classic, you know, rock classic, 99p. It's determined by the fact that Apple has a 95% share, at the time I start writing this book, of online digital music, uh, or that which is paid for. They can dictate the price. That's the defense mechanism. Of course, then you create technologies that you have to in use. It, it's easier to use certain technologies uh, that help you maintain that price. Now, uh, economics says that the, moment that, is, it, the mo moment that monopoly is subjected to effective competition, price should fall. And there's an a website called Information is Beautiful who've logged the impact of the competition. Because right now, to make the minimum wage in the USA, a solo artist signed to a record label will have to get 1,500 plays on iTunes uh, of a single track to make the minimum wage. On Spotify, it's 1.1 million. So the price, the, the, the impact of competition has collapsed. Tell me what power of 10 that is. Uh, it's collapsed the price. Right, now, to, to, to cut to the chase, the, the, there's, there's that, there's the, there's the tech monopolies. There is the fact that we've actually begun to, as well as human beings, I would argue, uh, live and create value and create our own social image much more outside work than, than my dad's generation did. You will know that workers for 200 years thought of themselves as kind of communities and factories. Now, through network technology, we, we create several, several personalities and we live in networks. We live far more in networks. We are leaky in the terms, terms of our, our personalities, ourselves, in a way that previous generations didn't do. Um, and at the edges, we are beginning to see new forms of economic production. So all the open source stuff is a new form of economic life. It doesn't map onto the state, the market, the public library. It's different. 
Um, and I argue that we might therefore be in the beginning of a long transition whereby the state, which we know, which provides, you know, maybe 30 to 40 percent of GDP um, through providing essential services, the private sector, which has provided the rest, and then this new non-market, difficult to price, free stuff and voluntary in cooperation sector is growing up alongside it. What's the problem? What's the problem for me? If you use Ruby on Rails or PHP or whatever, it's not a problem for you. The problem for me as an economist is how do I value it? Um, there's a brilliant tool called CATIA, which, make, which is used to virtually manufacture aircraft. If you look at the small print in Dassault, Dassault Systems owns this software. It's about well, 25,000 a head, a, a desk. It's a really top end software. And in the small print of their annual report, it says, what's the main risk to this company? It says, the main risk to this company is that somebody works out how to copy and paste the, copy, the, 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 the program CATIA 3.0. Uh, because if they can do that, then the value of this company falls from there to there. So economics just doesn't know how to value or understand this third uh, post-capitalist sector. And the challenge for us is to, is to work out what to do about it and whether or not it's a good thing. I did a debate about this book uh, a couple of weeks ago with, a, with one of Jeremy Corbyn's advisors. And, and, a, and a developer from the open source um, wor world stood up, this is St. Paul's Cathedral, and said, well, what, do you, what, should, what should happen to me then? Uh, should I be paid wages for developing an open source product? And I said, no, because that's post-capitalism. The point is, I write my Wikipedia page. I'm going to make a documentary and put it out for free crowdfunded on Indiegogo because I believe in this. I, I want to, you know, I go to an organic farm and buy it because I believe in it. And I want part of my life to be non-capitalist. And this Corbyn advisor said, no, no, you should be paid wages. And in other words, th they, they wanted to drag him back into the wage sector because they just couldn't understand what this new sector could become. I would like to expand that new sector for this reason. I once interviewed uh, Larry Page and Sergey Brim before the IPO uh, uh, and um, I said to them, what is your remaining ambition? And Larry Page said, um, I'd like to design a machine that knows everything. At which point there was this kind of massive jaw drop among kind of all the people who were sitting around because they all wanted to talk about company stuff. Yeah? I want to design a, ma a machine that knows everything. Well, there's an economist called Ken Arrow, who was once the guru of economics in the 1960s. He was one of the first people to think about intellectual property. We used to think intellectual property was like a, a public library. Uh, like, we used to think information was like a public library. It was a public good, like a water system you turn on and off, and etc. It's just there. In the 60s, we realised it wasn't that, and we needed to economically classify it and understand it. And Ken Arrow came up with one of the neatest um, descriptions of what information information property, information, pub owned information does. He says this, in a free market and with private ownership, if entrepreneurs produce patents and intellectual property, then the aim is for it to be scarce. Therefore, in a free market with private property, an intellectual in, in, in information economy will lead to a the under the systematic underutilization of information. Now, I would like to see a society where there is the systematic full utilization of information, and therefore, you, what, what I argue is that it, that you probably can't have private property in a free market in information, and it's the property bit that I would like to attack. The market bit is good; it it, it sorts out the information. It's the property bit. In other words, some of it should be free. It wants to be free. It should be free. And so what I would say to Larry Page now, I wish I'd thought of it then, but what I would say to him if I ever met him again is, you can't have that machine that knows everything, that even this thing that you guys work on, which is a machine that is trying to know a heck of a lot. Yeah? It can't know everything for this reason. You can ask it any question you want, but I can't ask it all the questions I want and therefore you don't know what my questions are. I can only ask it the dumb questions that I ask via the interface, whereas if it was open source, we could all ask it every question. And then your machine would, be far, would, would know everything far quicker than it's going to at the current rate. Uh, I don't know what that means for the commercial model, but it means that 
if we all open sourced more stuff, then the, 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 the leading edge of what, that which is not ownable, not rather that is ownable, that has ultra value, that is innovative, would be far more identifiable. And we'd all have a far more equitable relationship which that which, with that which should be shared, which I think is far more than is currently being shared. That's it. Great. Thank you very much. <laughs> just, just a few things to pick up on there. Um, Eric Schmidt, he, he famously said, Google is a proudly capitalistic uh, company. So what does post-capitalism selfishly mean for Google, and what do you think it should mean for Google? Okay. Um, I, look, I think when, when there was a phase in Google's history, and we, we recovered it, you know, I've, I've watched it go from a good idea, you know, to, to, to you, you know, one of the most important corporations in the world, where you had to say, look, you know, we have to decide that which is capitalist and that which is not capitalist. You could rationalise the 80-20 principle as, and completely capitalistically, and you probably do now, uh, but, the, but there are non-capitalist ways of even rationalising that. However, the, the, for, for future-proofing a giant tech monopoly, I think what you have to understand is that this process of, of <coughs> the price mechanism dissolving is probably happening. It's like, it's like wily coyote. It's happening beneath your feet, even if you're running along horizontally. The price of stuff, of information stuff, is going to fall more rapidly than I think people understand. So future proof, easier to say, future proof iTunes by becoming Spotify, because you're just not going to ca carry on being able to charge 99p, bam, 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 bam. Future proof HBO by becoming Netflix. It's, the, it's kind of move to, the, move to a quasi sharing uh, thing, even if you're still charging, but I don't think even that's going to last. Clay Christiansen, who's the guy who invented the idea of dis disruptive technology, always points out that you know, BlackBerry just could not last, despite having a cast iron infotech and defensible IP monopoly, it just disappeared. So you've always got to be asking yourself, not how do we stop ourselves, how do we keep BlackBerry being the only cell smartphone? You can't, it's not going to be. So you just have to ask yourself, what does a corporation do as one monopoly after another kind of falls away from us? And I think you, you are. That's, I mean, that's what's behind, clearly to me, it's behind... Popular yeah. rather than Monopoly, but... Uh, <laughs> I know you don't like Monopoly. Um, so uh, get ready for questions in the room. There's just one question I want to ask you before that, which yeah. is uh, about Karl Marx. And you, well, there's a fascinating passage where you, you pick up on, on a sort of lost uh, document that Karl Marx wrote in 1858 where, where he kind of predicted this. And there's, there's a quote which I picked out, which is, capital collapses because it cannot exist alongside shared knowledge. Yeah. So, yeah, it's an amazing document, the fragment. It's called The Fragment on Machines. And it wasn't discovered by me. It was it actually really popularised by a guy called Antonio Negri, who is now well known for his work on the multitude and, and the kind of far left of Italian uh, politics. He was even more far left then. But Negri and the Italian autonomist Marxists discovered this text. And what they recognised is there's a completely other collapse story in there than, than there is in the normal Marxism of Das Kapital, which is all about the clash between private ownership and, and equitable distribution, effectively. Uh, so in the fragment, he basically says, look, right, what we're getting is a kind of technology where, the, where all its effectiveness and productivity is, is, derives from what he called social knowledge. That is... Um, you know, he'd observed telegraphers. Telegraphers don't just work with a uh, kind of a switch. The machine is all the telegraphers. In other words, it's an early network. You could probably look at early railway networks and then identify some early features of network rather than simply hierarchy in them. And Marx is saying, what this is going to lead to is when all the innovative uh, power of society is concentrated at the level of ideas, then the private property side of things is going to fall apart. And in an amazing leap, he calls it the general intellect. When there is a general intellect, you can't have private property. But in an amazing leap, he then does this thought experiment. He says, right, what would the ideal machine be for capitalism? And he says, it would be a machine that costs nothing to make and lasts forever. Um, because he says, then, you know, then everything it does is beneficial and everything it does draws down the social knowledge and, and, and it costs nothing to do. I mean, in other words, you know, 
I think software is a machine that costs nothing to reproduce and would last forever if you wanted it to. It only, it only becomes obsolete. It could last. I'm sure that there's a version of Windows 3 sitting on a crappy old laptop in my loft somewhere. If I fired it up, I've got a Mac that can fire up and it's still got, from 1984, it still works. So it's kind of, it's the idea, and the, the problem is it's called, he wrote it at 4 a.m. in 1858 and then he, he never published it. And, and therefore, it, we, everybody forgot about it. But it's a fascinating sort of insight into some of the problems we are facing. Right, your questions, and please wait for the microphone to come to you. Hi, uh, I get the impression that you think that uh, interpersonal bandwidth has increased because of distributed uh, networks and distributed communication. But isn't it much more true that it's massively decreased because now we are communicating through distributed networks based on text and video very asynchronously rather than face-to-face as we're doing now with our massive bandwidth of all of the unconscious ability to read each other. And so the effect of social media is not to uh, increase intra- uh, important information distribution, it's to decrease the ability of uh, the workers <coughs> to organize. Well. I think there's, there's loads of concepts there, and, and, and my brain's struggling to unpack some of them, but let me, let me, let me, I think it was the novelist Thomas Pinchon, who in 1967, in the novel Gravity's Rainbow, actually said, um, bandwidth um, increases in inverse proportion to density. Uh, that about people, you know, in other words, that, that I, let me, let me tell you what that means to me. As a result of the information revolution, I feel a denser person, and a more, conne- I mean denser, and a richer person, and a more connected person. And I feel that I'm able to, 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 to bring, to upload knowledge, use it and download knowledge in a way that I, I couldn't before the information age. Literally, my brain is a product of the, this transition. And, and things that I would have had to spend years analogly learning to remember, I now don't have to. So I think that makes me a more richer person. But I do buy the idea that we now have weak ties. We have what, what the sociologist Richard Sennett has called weak ties. But the weak, in a network, the weak ties can pr- provide collective strength. Uh, okay, I would say that personally I am a much less dense person in that sense because each day I get on a train for an hour and I stand in a metal tube with a hundred strangers, none of whom I talk to and everyone is on their phone, getting a much lower bandwidth connection to the people around them. Um, may I ask another question? Yeah. Uh, do you think that there is no anal- an analogy at all uh, between open source software and free enclosure uh, common land? I do think there is. So I don't use the word commons because I think because the commons is an overused thing in the world that I'm talking about. In the sense that I want to try and the the commons was were part of feudalism. This is what people don't understand. That a common a common was a forest, and the point that the free stuff you got from it was firewood. Which, if you think about being a peasant, that's quite important. Otherwise, you don't eat. Right. You, if they'd said, you can't chop the king's trees down, which everywhere else except the commons, that was true, you starve. So the commons is a key part of feudalism. And in Shakespeare, where do people go when they want to dream and be free? They always go to a forest. Now, in other words, it has that mythic and almost functional uh, role in feudalism. The commons in capitalism can't exist. It's inimical to, to, to them. Uh, in post-capitalism, You have to promote that which is common. But what I'm wary of is the obsession with specific forms of peer-to-peer, quite um, low-level stuff. I think that that we'll have different ranges of stuff, that uh, things we produce, some of which will be common like common, some of which will be kind of a negotiated sharing. Uh, Creative Commons license isn't really a common in that sense. I've published Creative Commons stuff and I'm, all, I'm rigorously sticking those little extra bits on it so that, yeah, so that my rivals can't copy it. And uh, I mean, Creative Commons is a negotiated common rather than a flat freedom. But I, I, I could, we could talk a lot more about this. Do you want to um, take a question over here? Yeah. Microphone. Okay, right. So um, you may feel this is a fact that you've come across as um, quite Marxist, really. And the best thing about Marx is always the analysis and critique of capitalism. 
Um, but he also talks about power structures and the dynamics of the society trying to perpetuate a system. So my question to you is, um, do you think that the, the, the pressures on price you described, which are analogous to some of the things which were happening in the 19th century with mass production, um, are going to result in the world evolving naturally to post capitalism? In other words, do you basically think the market mechanism works and Spotify will conquer Apple and then whatever com comes next will conquer Spotify? Or do you think there's an issue about how we get there? And if there is an issue about how we get there, how do you resolve that? Yeah. I, I certainly think there is an issue about how we get there. I certainly think that all that there are that there are both political and economic mechanisms because y your own company, and it's not alone in the tech sphere, will spend a lot of money going to Brussels and to Washington DC to lobby for less regulation on a specific sector. Okay. Now I would like to regulate some of the tech monopolies not so much out of existence, but to be non-monopolies. So, you know, I'd be quite happy to have a big six in search or a big six uh, in friendship provision of social media or a big six messaging apps. I mean, there's only there's two or three. You know, I think, I, I think that regulation doing its job in the kind of uh, Theodore Rooseveltian sense, pre-1914, <coughs> should be promoting a lot more competition. I don't buy the idea that we need a big one in each sector to achieve scale and to achieve efficiency. So I would do that, and I would also then look at the part. The problem we have is that's a second order problem. The first order problem we have is we've got an elite in the world that's, that's addicted to low wage, low value creation. You don't work in a low wage, low value uh, world, but you, I'll tell you that, that basically a lot of, there's a huge incentive to create low value businesses and not innovate. You can innovate in the world of coffee, uh, coffee shop logo design. Yeah, that's about maximum innovation or, or um, how, to, how to get the nicest high-vis jackets for your semi-slave construction workers. That's where innovation is taking place. And I want innovation to take place that wipes those jobs out um, and replaces them with a more equitable distribution of work and money, not through the wages system. But yeah, there's a massive uh, obstacle to it. And uh, what I've tried to do in the book is to provide the economic framework for having the argument and leave it to everybody from you know, social democrats in Norway or Sweden right through to anarchists who are kind of blockading COP21 right now to have the debate about what you do about it. Because I think that the, the it that you want to do something about, the, the transition, is not well understood. So I'd, I've stepped back from that debate to try and actually have the debate across parties you know, and across kind of social milieu. Hi. Um, one of the things that I wanted to write was that the crisis that's happening is a crisis of profitability. It's not so much of the fall. And the way we solved the last crisis was the one that predicated this. And it follows that one, the way that we'll solve this is the one that we'll create the next. And the one that we're creating at the moment is, a, is one of no interest, so absolutely no savings, and a, a lack of and a public sector that's being absolutely removed, which will create and create more space for private sector enterprise. We create by destroying, and that's the way it's happened since the end of the Second World War. Um, and I think that that's where the focus is. I'm not sure if open source technology is where the, the cutting edge of you know, where the next crisis will be, or what the solve will be. If there was a place in the world we could all go and I had to work, it would be bombed. So you know, <laughs> wherever there is a, the, the prospect of a bubble with a side capitalism that is non-capitalist, it will be closed, it will be popped. Because I, what you said it's an angle with this, an angle with um, it existing is a contradiction that it cannot contest and it cannot confront. Well, I think, I see what you mean, and I think, I think that's quite pessimistic. And, but, but, all right, let's talk about one of the things you talked about, the stagnation, the stagnation problem is a real problem. You're starting your careers, your early stage career, most of the people in this room, you're in your, you, you, where zero interest rates are normal. This is bizarre. You know, it's, it's, that's not capitalism. Capital is money that makes more money. Uh, you cannot have a capitalism where, where money, you, to hold money in the bank costs you money. That's an abnormal capitalism. The reason we have it is because we haven't sorted out the, over, the debt overhang of the post-2000 situation. That's a kind of short order problem. I know what the answer to that is, write off some debts. Uh, make, some people, make some people who have savings poorer, unfortunately, and inflate your way out of it. That's what you do. We can't do it. The Greeks tried to just do one bit of it and bang, like you say, they were, they were quite clearly um, you know, heavily pressured. But I think I've got this great favourite passage from Hilary Mantel's Wolf Hall, where um, 
where, do you remember, those of you who've seen it, where um, Mark Rylance, the kind of uh, Thomas Cromwell uh, figure, he gets the, this uh, hapless aristocrat called Harry Percy, uh, and he's basically trying to kind of heavy him. And he says, look, you think, you think, this is in 1515, 15, whatever, you think the world is based on jousting and castles and chivalry and, you know, feasts. I know the world is based on banking. And I can switch, I know this because I can switch your world off tomorrow. I, if you don't, I don't like you. I can take you out. You can't take me out. Post-capitalism is about saying, look, to capitalists, you think the world is based on banking. You think the world is based on private property and large monopolies, tech IP. We can switch it off, but I don't want to do it in a kind of, in a kind of aggressive way. I want to persuade people that we should switch part of it off. And yeah, exactly to create a bubble. And some of these bubbles are not, they're, they're not smashable. A lot of the anarchist networks in Athens are this slogan, you can't default on a squat. You can't default on an occupied space. I, I don't necessarily think occupied spaces are the same as Wikipedia or Ruby on Rails, whatever, open source projects. They're different parts of it, of what we will use to make this synth synthetic new part of the economy. And we haven't done it yet. So I don't know, the, the transition is a challenge. How do, you, how do you reconcile that with the state's monopoly of violence? Because they can close down the squad. Yeah, they can, the state has a monopoly on violence everywhere, but um, I've seen in my professional career um, large masses of people use technology to overcome that. Even now, the, the people who are the most expert in the Egyptian revolution will tell you that it's not over. That, the, that Even now, when you think it's over, 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 it's not. The, the, the networks are alive, the ideas. This is what the great thing about Infotech is. That in the information world, no act, you'll know this from your work, no act of imagination is wasted because you can always record it and use it later. Uh, in the world of analog, it then kind of it's, it's about spontaneity and it's, the moment's gone. And so I think a lot of people are react to state crackdowns. Like Syria, you, could, you can imagine a, we should be creating now a virtual Syrian university. In fact, you guys could do it with your corporate weight, you, Facebook, etc. Virtual Syrian university that when it's over, just basically moves from the digital space to the analog space, lands like a spaceship, and it can start working immediately. We couldn't do things like that 20 years ago. I was wondering what your thoughts are on GMI or basic income. Yeah, well, I'm in favor of it. Uh, the, the, the basic, universal basic income, or the state as the, as the employer of last resort, is the, is the quick and dirty, or slow and dirty, but still nevertheless short-term answer to this problem of how do we rapidly automate. I see it as a one-off subsidy for rapidly automating the world. But of course, who pays? It's the taxpayer. You could, I, I've done a back of the envelope calculation that to pay everybody the same as the state pension here, from, as of right, no means testing whatsoever. You get it whether you're at work or not, six grand, uh, would, would double the welfare bill. But um, some of the right-wing pro proponents of, um, of, of the basic income have kind of grasped, grasped some of the economies of scale that you could do via that. That is actually, you know, for example, if you, you could make it, you, you don't gonna, you're going to means test people, but lots of diseases are to do with poverty. Um, lots of disease. And you could basically say, okay, well, what do we save from that from the ta for the taxpayer by managing diseases of poverty and, you know, mental illness, you know, type 2 diabetes, etc., stress, hypertension in, in oppressed communities, very high. So if you could just take some of the stress away from them by making them not have to worry about where the money comes from, you could probably save some of the, what it costs society that way. So, but look, you know, it's not... Everybody knows about the basic income proposal and there's a right-wing and left-wing version of it. What is amazing is no serious politicians are prepared to countenance it. I have a question on the net <coughs> So you um, talked a lot about the copying being free, which it is, but the first copy is always really yeah. expensive. And you haven't really said how do you motivate excellent creation. Uh, exactly. And I think that, um, so my answer to that is that those of us who create intellectual products only have to be really have to really get it into our heads why we're doing it. So I've written this book. It goes out as an analog copy like this, and I'm absolutely certain there's a PDF of it somewhere on BitTorrent. But why do why do I, why do I want to do that? Because ultimately, I want to make a statement to the world. Um, and most authors will tell you that our versus hours versus income is minimum wage uh, across lots of 
uh, of branches of writing. Um, but I know that, uh, that as an intellectual product, as an e-book, it is either copyable or very easily. So what do I do? What do I do? Where does somebody like me make higher value work? They make it in corporate speaking engagements. They make it in advice, in consultancy. That's, what, what, uh, no, that's what's normal. Uh, let me put it this way. Certain key artists don't really care about, <laughs> about whether their work is pirated because Glastonbury sells out in three hours. And in other words, you move to the analog. So as creators of intellectual property, we have to be really ask ourselves, where's the reward going to be? Uh, now, Hollywood has an answer to this called lawyers. You know, they would like you know, the copyright on James Bond's Diamonds Are Forever to be still in existence when the world has atomized and become dust. Yeah, it matters to them. Uh, it, their contracts say all time and forever in the universe uh, is the copyright. Yeah? But so, so you can, what you can do is you can reward the record quicker and spikier the, the creation. I don't think the Beatles wrote their music so it could be still in copyright in, 20, in 2050. I think they wrote it to meet attractive members of the opposite sex and smoke so, dope. Uh, <laughs> no, it feels this makes sense, but if you think about the classic examples which are always brought up in the intellectual property field, which are um, life-saving drugs yeah. and software is the other one, the, you know, creating a new drug costs billions yeah. And a lot of that work is hard work and not particularly exciting and not fulfilling. The reason you're doing it is clear, you want to save lives in a perfect society, but it's still expensive yeah. and you still have to reward that somehow. You do. And, and I, I, would, I would simply create a copyright mentality that is shorter and, shorter and steeper. And I think that's doable. If you look at the different copyrights and, and, and patent uh, laws for IP, it, it, is, it goes from... Of course, you know the example of the, in the generic drugs, so the HIV drugs. The Indian government basically busted the world's uh, pharma uh, companies and said, no, you're not going to do, no matter how talented your guys were, no matter how long they spent in a lab and how boring it was, this has to be deployed now, so we're going we're to produce it generically. And the pharma industry has had to react to that, probably not in a very, in some sense, not in a very virtuous way, because what they've had to do is pursue that form of intellectual property, which is niche. So often you get pharmaceutical giants now looking for a, a pipeline of products that is so niche that you're sometimes wondering whether or not it's simply designed to avoid the generic dr drug thing. No, I think the way they avoid it is they go, if our <coughs> HIV drugs are going, we're not going to research HIV drugs, so we're going to research antidepressants because we can That's sell those in the US yeah. where it's still protected. Right. Yeah, and so you end up losing a net benefit. So, 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 Society has to take that on board, and more important to you, to your world, I think it has to take it on board at a level of, it, of, of pure information property. And I think it's, it, it, this is what we're all we're, we're grappling with. I'd be quite happy to see copyright, quite happy, Penguin wouldn't, but I'd be quite happy to see copyright shortened for, for intellectual, uh, pure intellectual products like that. And sh because in the real world, it is, you know, in, in, I'm sorry, I, I don't know how good I am, but basically, if I don't see that in a kind of some kind of Oxfam shop in the next year or so, I'll be very surprised. That's the analog version of, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the long but, but narrow tail of information products. So, uh, so, yeah, shorter but spikier rewards and recognizing that, that there are tactical things that you can do, which is move to the world of analog space. Um, and sometimes it's nicer. Actually, the, the, net, the bandwidth of a concert is high, whereas the bandwidth of heat with the white, white wire is not as high. Yeah, I mean, you, you talked about, you know, actually people laughed when you said what we used to know as life. Mm. But the, you know, we see books about chopping wood and living in cabins and you know, responding to your concern about not talking to people on the tube. I mean, th these things are sort of bound up together, aren't they? Mm. Well, you know, and, and also about... I, there's a story that isn't mine of, of a, a kind of famous iconic case study of a guy who made axes in Sweden and basically he had a, he had a mass production axe company and it wasn't getting anywhere so they went away and rethought for a, a year and said right well we've got an axe museum so we'll look at 700 axes because you need axes in the Nordic country to chop your wood it's not just a kind of status item uh, and, uh, and, and so they, they designed what they thought was a perfect axe and so they produced it as a kind of craft product and that lasted two years until a Chinese version of it turned up in their equivalent of B&Q. And so they went, well, what can we do? So they simply, as well as all the kind of extra bit of n nice packaging and kind of paper and you get your individual acts, they just said, it's got a lifetime guarantee. When it runs out, when, it's, when, it's, when it actually you know, breaks, 
just bring it back. You can have one for free. And in other words, that was a rethinking of a very physical product in a kind of open source way, or a certainly a quasi open source way. And I think that it's just a good example to me about, about so you talking about lifestyle, life and work. It's about think, thinking about, thinking beyond the, the, the short term remuneration issue of work. I mean, you, you, the, the, the 80 20 thing, you know, is, is a good example of, of doing it, but I bet there are other corporations that do it in an in a even more interesting way that we haven't heard about yet. Uh, yeah, there we go. Okay, going back to your universal income question, how would you handle that against the type of goods, and I think primarily sort of housing here, yeah. where it's a competitive bidding war, there's a limited amount of housing, so if you just yeah. increase everyone's uh, income by a factor of 10, all that happens is by next year, house prices have gone up by a factor of 10. I wouldn't, I wouldn't increase anybody's income by a factor of 10, at least by a factor of 0 0.1 is more like, but, but yeah, well, you know, weirdly, um, even it is weird, especially for, uh, maybe people from, from uh, beyond the Brit British Isles, born outside the British Isles, or young. You know, when my grandma, she lived in a slum for the first uh, 30 years of her life, and just before World War II, something quite remarkable happened. The state gave her a house. Uh, they gave it to her. She didn't have to buy it. The rent was minimal, and, and she could have it for life. You know, basically, social housing could be cheap or free. And actually, um, we know how many people there are, we know what the population projections are, we know what the demand side is gonna be. You could easily meet the, the demand with supply and tank the market if you wanted. I don't see that as a big problem. I see the problem you, did, did you, 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 you describe as, what if everybody's income is kind of reliable? Does it suppress competition? Because it, it, it would. You could actually choose, if somebody paid me X grand a year not to work, I'd probably work less. And the reason I wanted think us to think about doing that is because I don't think there's going to be enough work to go around of a satisfying nature. And what's going to happen, and I, you know, there's a lot of angst around uh, gender balance and, and ethnicity balance in, in workforces. And I'm glad to see you, know, you guys have clearly put a lot of thought into how to do that. But 20, 30 years down the line, you're going to have, you're going to have male v female, black v white, et cetera, et cetera competition over a very, very scarce number of high value jobs. And I think we need to kind of address that really, you know, to avoid it all being the Oxbridge graduates who get everything. We just have to kind of think around the problem societally. Okay, so I still think before universal income could be a thing, you would have to vastly increase the supply of houses. Otherwise, at the moment, if someone's yeah. you know, getting 6K a year, yeah. Uh, but then basically the rent is aimed at the level of, right, your rent is going to be, you can just live on, say, yeah. 500 pounds for your groceries, so I'm going to set rent at 5,500. Yeah. If you increase yeah. the universal to 10, all that happens <laughs> is the rent's going to go up to 9,500, which is everything you've got other than you need to survive. I mean, I would just, I mean, what, what I'm talking about here is, is not a series of short-term measures. I'm trying to design a kind of holistic uh, framework for how to act. I mean, and it, alongside it, there, if, to take the exact spe specific example you use, you just do what New York had, did in the 50s, rent control. I mean, that would, yeah, no, it would tank the buy-to-let market. But these are short-term issues. They don't solve the long-term issues I'm talking about. Do we have time for a couple of questions? Yeah, yeah, one more, one more. Yeah. Um, so how do you think that the uh, current structure of the state and the taxation system that the state uses to fund itself will need to change? Especially now when we have people who are very highly trained, who the state puts a lot of money into training, who make something at a one-time cost that then is distributed everywhere for nothing. Do you need to tax on, on the redistribution of something, or is that an impossible thing because the company is making no money on it? In the two minutes remaining. Go on then. Um, well, well, okay, you, I say in the book that, that a basic income is only a transitional measure because if you, my ultimate aim is to make as much stuff as possible abundant. And so basically, 
you know, to dissolve. It's like taking the complexities of, of, of the economy, drawing them on blotting paper and then dipping it in water. Basically, the complexities disappear when stuff is free. You know, I, it's like, you know, if I take your ball pen off your desk, you don't come running down to reception saying, give it me back. In the sense that once stuff is abundant, you tend to stop thinking about it. So that, that is the solution to, to that. But in the process, if, the, if you've got a state, a market and a non-market sector, then, of course, the, think of it like this. You know, the, the taxes from the market sector pays for the state. But what comes from the non-market sector? You know, the OECD is very clear. This well, non-market sector is big physically, but we just can't value it economically, nor can we tax it. So, you know, the capitalist solution is to turn Wikipedia into a corporation, make 27,000 people micro-employees, and, and get it to pay tax. That would be the solution. My solution would be to say, to understand that actually what a product like Wikipedia, well, we could use others as examples, it's actually creating a non-market value through both the market sector and the state. It is like it's the bit that you've already dipped in the water. We can't measure it economically. So what we have to do is to these other two bits, to really focus on them, the state and the market, and say, hold on a minute, they're going to be under a long-term, strategic, century-long pressure from this new sector because it's going to, it looks like it's sucking value. I mean, the, the example I give as well is the, is the, is the Internet of Things. There's a lot of hype around the Internet of Things. It's being described as a $9 trillion opportunity. Yeah, it is, to take $9 trillion of value out of the economy. Because all it'll do is make things cheaper. I can't, yes, Cisco and whoever makes switches will make a lot of money. Whoever installs all the smart meters in people's homes make a lot of money. You guys have got this app thing, haven't you? You've got the, this house, this house, house thing, house energy thing. I can't remember what it's called. Yeah. Nest, yeah, I don't use it because uh, my, uh, my house is analogue. Um, but, um, but, yeah, you'll make money out of that. But ultimately what IoT will do is it's, it, it, will basically, it will basically make things cheaper because it's going to make utilisation of energy capacity, utilisation of transport capacity very, very efficient. Uh, so so you, have to, you have to ask the question, how do we manage the transition to where this is a bigger sector and a more virtuous relationship between what the open source and free sector provides to the other two sectors for free is utilised in, in an efficient way rather than it being seen as what I described it as, sucking value from it, which is how economists would try and, they'd say, look, you know, people now will say, you know, Wikipedia is a three billion hole in the ad market. That's how people look at it. Well, no, to me, it's a great future opportunity and virtuous thing, and I want to make it better and more protected while... Controlling the, controlling the deflation of the other two sectors. And for the left-wingers here, you know, the traditional left, it actually does mean as well the deflation of the state sector as well as the deflation of the market sector. But on that note, and, and the caveat that everything I say is as, as a kind of, look, as a kind of think challenger. That's what I'm doing here. I'm not handing down a kind of peer-reviewed engineering certified thing and I, I'm, I'm offering a series of challenging ideas and I'm absolutely certain that your generation of economic engineering software business process specialists will come up with the solutions. I don't have the solutions. Paul, thank, thank you very much indeed. A pleasure. Thank you.